This is Speak, beginning on page 125. Germination. We finished the plant unit in biology. Miss Keen drops 10 pound hints that the test will focus on seeds. I study. How seeds get planted. This is actually cool. Some plants spit their seeds into the wind. Others make seeds yummy enough for birds to eat so they get pooped out on passing cars. Plants make way more seeds than they need because they know that life is not perfect and all the seeds won't make it. Kind of smart when you think about it. People used to do that too. Have 12 or 15 kids because they figured that some would die, some would turn out rotten, and a couple would be hardworking, honest farmers who knew how to plant seeds. What seeds need to germinate? Seeds are inefficient. If the seed is planted too deep, it doesn't warm up at the right time. Plant is too close to the surface and a crow eats it. Too much rain and the seed molds. Not enough rain and it never gets started. Even if it does manage to sprout, it can be choked by weeds, rooted up by a dog, mashed by a soccer ball, or ex asphyxiated by car exhaust. It's amazing anything survives. How plants grow, quickly. Most plants grow fast and die young. People get 70 years. A bean, plants get, a bean plant gets four months, maybe five. Once the itty bitty baby plant peeks out of the ground, it sprouts, it sprouts leaves so it can absorb more sun. Then it sleeps, eats, and sunbathes until it's ready to flower, a teenage plant. This is a bad time to be a rose or a zinnia or a marigold because people attack with scissors and cut off what's pretty. But plants are cool. If the rose is picked, the plant grows another one. It needs to bloom to produce more seeds. I am going to ace this test. Baloney Exile My cafeteria strategy has changed since I have no friends in the known universe. First off, I don't go through the line for anything to avoid that vulnerable moment of coming out into the lunchroom, that moment when every head lifts and evaluates friend, enemy, or loser. So I brown bag it. I had to write a note to my mother asking her to buy lunch bags, bologna, and a little and little containers of applesauce. The note made her happy. She came home from the store with all kinds of junk food I could take. Maybe I should start talking to them, maybe a little bit. But what if I say the wrong thing? Baloney girl, that's me. I try to read while eating alone, but the noise gets between my eyes and the page and I can't see through it. I observe. I pretend I'm a scientist on the outside looking in, the way Miss Keene describes her days watching rats get lost in mazes. The Marthas don't look lost. They sit in formation, a new girl in my old seat, a sophomore who just moved here from Oregon. Her clothes have a dangerously high percentage of polyester. She needs to get that taken care of. They nibble carrot sticks and olives, spread pate onto stone ground wheat crackers, and trade bits of goat cheese. Megan, Emily, and Heather drank cranberry apricot juice. Too bad I can't buy stock in the juice company. I am watching a trend in the making. Are they talking about me? They're certainly laughing enough. I chop my sandwich and it barfs mustard on my shirt. Maybe they're planning the next project. They could mail snowballs to the weather-deprived children in Texas. They could knit goat hair blankets for shorn sheep. I imagine what Heather might look like in 10 years, after two children and 70 pounds. It helps a little. Rachel slash Rochelle takes a seat at the end of my table with Hannah, the exchange student from Egypt. Rachel slash Rochelle is now experimenting with Islam. She wears a scarf on her head and some brown and red gauzy harem pants. Her eyes are ringed with black eyeliner thick as crayon. I think I see her looking at me, but I'm probably wrong. Hannah wears jeans and a Gap t-shirt. They eat hummus and pita and titter in French. There is a sprinkling of losers like me scattered among the happy teenagers, prunes in the oatmeal of school. The others have the social power to sit with other losers. I'm the only one sitting alone. Under the glowing neon sign which reads, Complete and total loser, not quite sane, stay away, do not feed. I go to the restroom to turn my shirt around so the mustard stain is hidden under my hair. Snow day, school as usual. 
We had eight inches of snow last night. In any other part of the country, that would mean a snow day. Not in Syracuse. We never get snow days. It snows an inch in South Carolina. Everything shuts down and they get on the six o'clock news. In our district, they plow early and often and put chains on the bus tires. Hair Woman tells us they canceled school for a whole week back in the 70s because of the energy crisis. It was wicked cold and would have cost too much to heat the school. She looks wistful. Wistful. One point vocab word. She blows her nose loudly and pops another smelly green cough drop. The wind blasts a snow drift against the window. Our teachers need a snow day. They look unusually pale. The men aren't shaving carefully and the women never remove their boots. They suffer from they suffer some sort of teacher flu. Their noses drip, their throats gum up. Their teachers are rimmed with red. They come to school long enough to infect the staff room, then go home sick when the sub shows up. Hair woman says, open your books now. Who can tell me what snow symbolized to Hawthorne? Class groans. Hawthorne wanted snow to symbolize cold. That's what I think. Cold and silence. Nothing quieter than snow. The sky screams to deliver it. A hundred banshees flying on the edge of the blizzard. But once the snow covers the ground, it hushes as still as my heart. Stupid, stupid. I sneak into my closet after school because I can't face the idea of riding home on a bus full of sweaty, smiling teeth sucking up my, ox my oxygen. I say hello to my poster of Maya and my cubist tree. My turkey bone sculpture has fallen down again. I prop it up on the shelf next to the mirror. It slides back down and lies flat. I leave it there and curl up in my chair. The closet is warm and I'm ready for a nap. I've been having trouble sleeping at home. I wake up because the covers are on the floor or because I'm standing at the kitchen door trying to get out. It feels safer in my little hideaway. I doze off. I wake to the sound of girls screaming, be aggressive, B B aggressive, B E A G G R E S S I V E. For a minute there, I think that I've tripped into the land of the truly insane, but then a crowd roars. It is a basketball game. Last game of the season. I check my watch, 8.45. I've been asleep for hours. I grab my backpack and fly down the hall. The noise of the gym pulls me in. I stand by the door for the last minute of the game. The crowd chants down the last seconds, like it's New Year's Eve, then explode from the stands like angry hornets at the sound of the buzzer. We won, beating the Coats Coatesville Cougars 51-50. The cheerleaders weep, the coaches embrace. I get caught up in the excitement and clap like a little girl. This is my mistake, thinking I belong. I should have bolted for home immediately, but I don't. I hang around. I want to be a part of it all. David Petricus pushes toward the doors in the middle of the group of friends. He sees me looking at him and detaches himself from his pod. David says, Melinda, where were you sitting? Did you see that last shot? Unbelievable. Unfreaking, unbefreaking leaveable. He dribbles an imaginary ball on the ground, fakes left, right, then pulls up for a shot. David sh should stick to human rights ab abuses. He goes on and on a loose ball racing downhill. To hear him talk, you'd think they just won the NBA championship. Then he invites me back to his house for celebratory pizza. David says, Come on, Mel, you gotta come with us. My dad told me to bring anyone I wanted. We can give you a ride home after if you want. It'll be fun. You do remember fun, don't you? Nope, I don't do parties. No thanks. I trot out excuses. Homework, strict parents, tuba practice, late night dentist appointment, have to feed the warthogs. I don't have a good track record with parties. David doesn't bother to analyze my reluctance. If he were a girl, maybe he would have pleaded or whined more. Guys don't do that. Yes slash no. Stay slash go. Suit yourself. See you Monday. I think it's some kind of psychiatric disorder when you have more than one personality in your head. That's what it feels like when I walk home. The two Melindas fight every step of the way. Melinda one is pissed that she couldn't go to the party. Melinda once says, get a life, it was just pizza. He wasn't going to try anything, his parents were going to be there. 
You worry too much. You're never going to let us have any fun, are you? You're going to turn into one of those weird old ladies who has a hundred cats and calls the cops when kids cuss a cut across her yard. I can't stand you. Melinda, too, waits for one to finish her tantrum. Two carefully watches the bushes along the sidewalk for a lurking boogeyman or worse. Melinda, too, says, The world is a dangerous place. You don't know what would have happened. What if he was just saying his parents were going to be there? He could have been lying. You can never tell, tell when people are lying. Assume the worst. Plan for disaster. Now hurry up and get us home. I don't like it out here. It's too dark. If I kick both of them out of my head, who would be left?